Hi, my name is Sean Olson. Today I'm going to walk you through creating a very simple level. And this is going to be a lot different than uh, several of my other videos in the past, uh, which really focused on doing everything the way you would normally do it in 3ds Max. In long term, you should always want to make things and design from a perspective of understanding and using the Max perspective. I've had a lot of input from users that have come from Hammer that really have a hard time understanding some of the basic principles and concepts. And a lot of you from Hammer have been asking for videos that kind of explain things from a Hammer perspective. So that's what I'm going to do in this video. So we're just going to create a simple scene. And I'm going to start by adding a, a player into the scene. So I'm going to go over here and find on the toolbars here the launch point entities. So it's going to bring up a menu that lists all the entities available in the game. And I can create whatever entities are available in the current game. I'm currently uh, targeting CSGO. So I'm going to add a terrorist and a counter terrorist. So I'm going to click place entities and place these guys in the scene. I'm going to do a, a terrorist and a counter terrorist. Just add these into the scene somewhere. Sometimes you'll see that the textures may not appear right away. Uh, it's just a little glitch in the entity loader at times. If you select it, the material will appear on it. So we have two entities here. By adding them here, it gives us a sense of scale. So we have a terrorist, a counter terrorist, and we want to build our scene around the sizes of these players so everything is scaled correctly. So that's one good reason why you should add one of these to the scene to begin with. Now we can start adding our geometry. So we're going to start by using very basic primitives. We're going to go to the Create tab of the Command Panel and, and make sure we're on Standard Primitives, and we're just going to choose Box. So we're going to start making a box here. And notice, as I'm making this, there's a few things. One, it's not snapping to the grid. That's not very good for our purposes for the Source Engine. We really want to be snapped to the grid. Also, it's not showing us our dimensions, which is something that a lot of people using Hammer are really used to um, seeing in the viewport. So I'm going to right-click to cancel this. Right-click is a common way to cancel any function you're currently working on. And I'm going to turn on Snaps. Up here, that's a 3D toggle. This 3D Snaps icon. I can click that. If I turn that on, Snaps are on. And now I'm both snapping to the grid and to uh, the vertex. I'm going to turn off vertex snapping for the moment. So now if I go start creating a box, you're going to see it snaps as I get close to these grid points. It's snapping to those grid points. That's really good, but we still haven't seen the dimensions. So I'm going to right click and cancel this again. I'll show you this function in the main toolbar here. It's display selected object dimensions. When we click this, the dimensions of the currently selected objects will be displayed in the viewport. So if I click box now, and I start dragging out, you're going to see in the viewport the dimensions of the currently selected object. I'm going to click again to end the creation of this. I'm going to hide my point entities floater for the moment. And we're going to discuss this next thing, that the object in the scene has no material. So when you're making a brush in Hammer, the world geometry, it automatically creates a material based off of whatever is selected inside the Hammer material editor. That's not on by default inside of Max. Now there is a way to make it automatically assign materials and I'm not going to cover that in this video but I'm going to show you how to add materials to your brush geometry from the game. So I'm going to click this button here. It's the VMT browser. Now on some systems this browser may take a while to open. Uh, the faster your system and the more RAM, the better for this particular tool. So it is a little bit slow to open. I'm going to warn you about that. Once it's open, I generally keep it open, either docked or on another monitor. So now that it's open, I'm just going to dock it over here on the side for the moment. And you're going to see a file structure that's uh, showing you all the materials in your game. Uh, if we click on brick, it's going to list all the materials. I have to select on the, the name of the material to actually preview it. It's going to give you the name of the material here and what shader it's using. So remember when doing brushes, you generally want to use light map generic. So I'm going to choose in this one, we're going to go to concrete and just find a concrete texture. And once we find one we want to use, we just double click it. And we do that, it will assign the material to the object in the viewport. Whatever currently objects are selected will be assigned that material. 
Now at this point you may be tempted to go and start adjusting the UVs. That's the, the way the texture is uh, translated and scaled across the surface of your mesh. You can see on the uh, sides here it's kind of stretched out and it's really big on the top surface and we will adjust we will adjust that uh, momentarily but we're going to do it down the road instead of right now so now i'm going to add uh, some boxes around the, the sides to be walls and i can click here and drag out and we're just going to use this size and you're going to see that each time i go up it actually snaps to the current grid spacing size So right now the grid spacing is set at 128. If we wanted it to do a different size in the viewport and when we're dragging these out, we have these buttons up here to increase or decrease the grid spacing size. And these can be bound to keyboard shortcuts if you really wish. Now let's find a brick texture to add to this. So let's just add it to these four. And again, the texture scaling is really off. This is not what we want it to be. But um, in Hammer, you'd be really tempted to go in and start adjusting these. But I'm going to suggest we're going to refrain from the moment because it's a little bit more efficient uh, to work on multiple objects at once. So I'll show you that shortly. So now we're going to discuss uh, the next section here is uh, cloning objects and moving them around and, and using the snaps a little bit. So one method you might do in here is to select uh, these four um, brushes and clone them up above. And you might do it in another viewport. And we're going to assign a, a sky texture to those. So that will be um, sky instead of brick. So I'm going to first do it a way you might do it in Hammer first. And then we're going to undo that and, and do it a different way. But I'm going to show you the Hammer way here. So to use a more hammer-like method, let me move this off the view for the moment. I'm going to bring back the four different viewports in this case. And we'll, we're looking at it from left, top, front, and the perspective view. And this is kind of a way you might view it in hammer. And a lot of users in hammer might want to take these objects in one of these views and drag them up. So I have these four objects selected already. I'm going to hit F4 here to show you the edges and highlight the ones that we have selected. So what we could do is grab along here and make sure we'll activate this viewport. And you can see that it's the one active by the yellow outline. I middle mouse click to do that. So as long as I grab a point that is on this grid point to begin with, I can hold down shift and drag it up. And when I do that, it asks me if I want to make them copies, instances. For this case, I'm going to use copy because I don't necessarily want them to always be the same. Uh, and we're going to hit OK. So that's one way to do it in, in the viewport here is just make sure you drag from a, a grid point to another and shift drag. And that will allow you to copy it. But even though a lot of people that are used to Hammer like to always do this in these orthographic projections from top, left, right, etc., you don't always have to do that if you understand the snapping tools in Max. So I'm actually going to undo that and go back down here. And I'm going to reactivate my perspective view and maximize it. There's no need necessarily to go into these other views and to do that. So what I'm going to do is turn off Snap to Grid and instead turn on Snap to Vertex. And now when I hover over this point, you're going to see that the, the little yellow uh, snap point is actually down at that corner there, which happens to be at a grid point. And what I want to do instead is shift drag from there. So I'm going to hit the move um, gizmo and I'm going to actually select this little blue line right here, the Z axis on the transform gizmo. If I click that, it's highlighted. And now the only transformation that will happen now is in the Z axis. So no matter what happens now, it's only going to be in Z. So I'm going to shift drag from here to here and snap to that top point right there. And because I'm only doing it in the Z axis, I can actually pick a point over here, anywhere along that in that plane along the Z axis that I want to move it to. As long as I pick a point there, you're going to see it's going to snap to that point only up in the Z axis. And again, I'm going to copy it here. 
So this means you can stay in your perspective view and still shift, drag, and move things around and keep them on the grid and align them in certain ways without having to swap back and forth the other different viewport projections. Bring back our uh, VMT browser here. I'm going to go find the sky texture in here. And I'm going to assign this skybox texture to it. And again, you see all of these uh, materials are really stretched out and they're not really at the scale we want. But again, I'm holding off because I want to impress on you one change that you should do in Max as opposed to Hammer is, is the way you approach uh, UVs and texturing. And finally, we're going to shift drag this object up to the top here. I'm going to actually grab the bottom here of this bottom vertex and shift drag up here and copy it and apply the sky material. So now we have a sealed level in here. So again, when you're making levels for the source engine, your level has to be sealed by brushes. To so go inside here, you can see that we cannot see the outside world. Again, I'm going to hide my browser on the other monitor for a moment. And now I'm going to start thinking about uh, the texturing in here. And one thing I also want to do is make sure that my viewport matches a little bit more perspective view that you might see in the game and hammer. So I'm going to click up here and choose standard and go to my uh, per view uh, viewport preferences. And I want to change the perspective view angle to 90. It's more likely what you would see in Hammer in the game. So we have a wider view here and it will let us see more of what's going on. So at this point, we're going to deal with the textures. Now again, in Hammer, you would select a face and open up the face edit tool and and make the change and then go through each and every single different object and drop that texture transform on the faces. That's not how we're going to do it here. We're just going to select all of the, the brush geometry. So I'm just going to hit control A. I'm going to deselect these guys and deselect this. So I've got all of these brushes selected here. At this point, I'm going to open up the modify tab over here in the command panel. And you can see it says 10 objects selected. So whatever modifier I apply here is going to go to all 10 of them. And it's going to be what's called an instanced modifier. That means that the modifier on one is the same modifier that's on all the rest. In this case, we're going to put on a UVW map modifier. And by default, let me turn off show dimensions here. By default, it's going to make this the UVs planar projected from the top and they're projected down at the size of the current selection defined by this orange gizmo here. This is not what we want. We don't want them all from the top. We're going to use, in this case, just box. So we click this box. So now you're going to see that all of them are kind of, they're more uniform across here, but it's still the wrong scale. In this case, we're going to change these all to 256 by 256 by 256 over here in this. And now you're going to see that they're all defined by this square gizmo here. This gizmo will define where the textures tile at. So if I grab this gizmo and move it in any dimension, excuse me, is if I grab this gizmo by going over here to the modify tab, and opening up the UV map modifier, you'll see a gizmo sub object. I can select that. And now I can move just this gizmo. If I select this in any and move it, you're going to see it's going to move around everywhere. I can use snaps also, just like I did with the geometry, and snap it to different locations. So right now this is tiling at 256, and that may be what we want. And we can move it up and down here and snap it, uh, the center of this gizmo, to wherever we want. And it may not be what we want, but if we need to change the scale, we just go over here and change the scale of this UV tiling in the world. So if we wanted it to be 128 instead, to make it match the size of the wall height, you'll see that now we can make it do that. And you see this texture is actually skewed and really long. I didn't type 128 over here. I accidentally typed 1,285. We'll switch that back to 128. So you can see here, this gives you a lot of, a lot of power in controlling the texture scale and placement across multiple objects at once. And by keeping this as a UV object, we can just change them all on the fly whenever we choose to. This means changes we make don't require us to go to every single face and change them to, to see the changes. We just go in here and change this one UVW map modifier. Now, again, I have 10 objects selected. I'm going to just select one object and get out of the UV gizmo sub object mode. I'm going to just select one of them. 
And you'll see that by changing this one object's UV transform, it will change them all. And notice this UV WMAP modifier is in italics. That's letting you know that this modifier is being used on other objects. So again, if I change this, it's affecting all the objects, even though I'm only modifying the modifier on a single object. I can go back here to this gizmo, and if I want, let's move this up to 64 units to be in the middle here. And you can type in specific points if you want to, or drag here, or again, move the gizmo like we demonstrated earlier. If we want to snap this directly to the middle of this edge, we can do another type of point. And I'm going to turn off snap to vertex and do snap to midpoint. And in this case, um, I'm going to also make sure it only goes up and down here. And there we, we moved it up exactly half. And this aligned it to the top and bottom of this gizmo here. So there's a lot more to discuss about working with the UVs and texturing, uh, but that's going to be past the, the scope of this video. So now what we're going to do is add a, a couple entities in here and get this level uh, so that we can compile it. And hit F4 again to get rid of edge facing. I'm going to get out of the gizmo sub-object mode because since I'm in that mode, I can't select any object in the scene. I can only select the gizmo. So I'm going to click that gizmo to get out of it to this UVW map. Now I can select other objects in the scene. As soon as I select an object, you see the transform gizmo by default usually. You got to be careful that you don't accidentally select and move if that's not your intent. So a lot of times hit Q or this select object button when you just want to pick objects and not have to go in and, and transform them. But if you do want to transform them, go ahead and pick this Select and Move tool or hit W on your keyboard and it will let you select it and then move it. And again, we're moving around here. And currently I've snapped to midpoints on, so that's why you see this midpoint snap happening. Uh, it's on the midpoint of one of the brush edges that are down at the other side here. And I don't really want that right now. So I'm going to turn off Snap to Midpoint. And again, I'm only moving this in the XYZ, the, the XY axis right now, because right now you see that that's the axis I currently have highlighted with this transform gizmo. If I highlight this axis, the XZ, then any transformations I do are going to be in those two axes and not include Y. And if I click here, I'm going to be able to translate in, in many axes. And if you turn off snaps, um, you'll also be able to easily move things in any of the axes. So what we want to do here is actually move our terrorist back in this corner and we want to move our counter terrorist back over here in this corner. Also to make it easier for me to work with here, I'm going to create a viz group of these skybox objects. Actually, we, we may not even need to do that. We're going to open up the viz group manager and we're going to see that there's a sky we're going to hide the sky objects here. So this is for viz groups and auto viz groups. And um, I'm going to put this in my other screen. So it's easier for us to see here by hiding the sky. And we can look down on our little scene here. We're going to rotate these guys so they're looking at each other more. And now we need to build up a couple entities in the scene. We need a, a buy zone and we need a, a bomb target and we need some a couple other entities. So we're going to do that. So to start with here, let's create a couple boxes. Let's turn back snap to grid back on and turn on snaps. And I'm going to have a buy zone over here. And we're going to have a buy zone over here. What I can do now is open the brush entity floater and open this up. And we'll look for funk buy zone, which I currently have selected. So I'm going to select both of these and choose tie to entity. So now each one of these will be its own entity. So I select one of them and go to the Modify tab. You're going to see that all of this object's entity functions are over here on the side. So if I want a specific team, in this case, I just want Counter Terrace on this side, I choose that. And if I want this one to be just Terrace, I go over here and choose that. If I don't want to have to use the Modify tab, I can also add a function to my quad menus. If I right click here, you'll see an option here that says edit selected entity. This isn't in your menus by default, but you can add it. So when I do this, it will open up the entity 
functions and its outputs over here in this little floater. You can do that by going to customize, customize user interface and adding that function to your quads. Let's bring back the VMT browser here and let's put a tools invisible on this guy, on these two. So we have that. So now we want a, a bomb target and we'll put one here in the middle. Let's bomb target here in the middle and hide to entity. And again, any of the parameters we need are over here in the modify tab. We're not going to need that. So let's add a tools invisible to this guy too. Next, we should add a light. So I'm going to open up the entities here and we're going to choose light environment and add an environment light. And we're going to move this guy up here and it's just a light entity inside Max, but you can go over here and change the actual entity properties, including the color um, to anything that you might need for your specific scene. When it comes to lights and uh, other such things, you don't really type in the values over here. For pitch, yaw, roll, you just actually rotate it in the viewport. However, if you do need to import specific values in a hammer style method, you can use these buttons in this input field. So first I'm going to show you is this get button. If I click get, it's going to put in this field the values that you would have typed into hammer to get that view. And if I type in another number over here, uh, let's do 180 and hit set, it will rotate the object. It will rotate to that angle. And there may be a moment in that it doesn't uh, update in the viewport when you press this button, but it, so the functions here do not automatically uh, always translate immediately in the viewport. Uh, sometimes you have to click around a little bit for them to appear. Um, that's a bug that will probably be fixed in the future. But generally speaking, you don't need to use these numbers. You can just uh, use the gizmos to translate it because these numbers are not actually what's exported into the game engine. It's actually what the current transformation and rotation are of, of your light objects in the scene. And that's just for the pitch yaw roll. The other values do actually translate directly into the game engine. So let's close out these and we're almost ready to export this scene. So let's just unhide um, our sky just to make sure that the, the light that we have isn't sticking out of it. So it's out of the scene here. So I'm actually going to go ahead and compile this with this sky up here so you can see uh, a function here for uh, troubleshooting issues because this is going to cause a leak because the sky is outside the playable area, the, the, the light entity. In fact, let's move it all the way up outside so we can see this very specifically. Let's save the scene. And now if I go to VMF Exporter, this button here, or you can go to Wallworm Exporters and Export Scene as Game Level, you're going to see a bunch of functions here. Um, these are the settings for your compilers. Um, if you want the final that has static prop lighting, etc., you click that. If you want to have it set that it's going to pack the assets into the scene, um, you do that. But we're just going to do final here and we're going to compile it and we're going to tell it to actually show the results in the window. And we called this uh, basic level. So let's export this as basic level and it's going to export. And then you're going to see this compiler go through here and you should see that there are some leaks. It's going too fast. It did this. I'm going to close this out and I'm going to choose this log button here, which is going to open up our log file in my text editor. And you're going to see right here, we have leaked so that that light entity leaked into the scene because it's outside the level to troubleshoot leaks. You can hit this load leak file and we're going to choose basic level dot line. That's the, that's the line file that's going to show us what the leak is. If I double click that, um, you're going to see this line that gets generated and it has a camera actually on there and it will let you follow the the trajectory of that leak. So it's a way for you to, to kind of quickly figure out what it is. So we know the cause of this leak. So we're going to go ahead and delete this leak information and bring this back down inside of our playable area. 
save the scene. And this time, if we go to compile it, we will not get a leak. But let's just add a couple more things in here to make it slightly more interesting and to discuss one more thing that's different between Hammer and Max. I'm going to go ahead and hide this sky texture again, the sky tools. And let's add a couple uh, obstacles in here because we don't want a level where um, you can just see each other right away. So we're going to, again, use very basic brush tools here. I'm going to uh, decrease the grid size here. And we're just going to make a few walls just to add some places for, uh, to add some places to break up the scene some. All right, so we're gonna select all of these new brushes that we made here, and we're gonna apply a new texture to them. So let's just add some dev textures to these guys. Dead measure generic. All right, let's just, just put that on here. And again, so there's texture stretching isn't crazy and they're all uniform. We're going to add a UVW map and we're going to put on box. And for this one, um, we're going to do 96, 96. So all of these are now going to be at 96 units tiling. Save our scene. And we're going to go to the compiler here. And this time we're actually going to tell it to launch the game when we're done. Here we go. Basic level. So one thing I wanted to point out was, even though those sky ones are hidden, Wallworm by default will export even hidden geometry. So there's a difference between you the way you handle hidden things in Max and in Hammer. And that will be part of a discussion in another video when it comes to how the Viz Group Manager and Wallworm works compared to Hammer. So we'll go ahead and auto-select here. Now we have a couple issues. Well, we have one main issue, the sky. We'll discuss that now and we'll fix that. But as you can see here, we can run around our level now. So to fix the sky, we're going to go here and click the Open World tab. And it's going to list here what sky we want. We could change it here if we need to, but I, I wanted to open up this to show you that this is where the world parameters are at. But you don't have to because the VMF exporter itself will actually list the sky name that you can change here. In fact, it will list the skies that are currently available in the engine. Um, so I'm going to just choose sky dust for this case. And now we're going to go ahead and recompile the level. And now you can see our sky is now inside the scene. So you can always just change the sky from the VMF exporter dialog. So there are many things we did not discuss in this video. A lot of advanced topics, uh, using displacements, etc. But now at least you should understand how you can add brushes to the scene, add materials to the brushes, add entities to the scene. Again, this is the point entity floater up here, um, the brush entity over here. And once you tie something to an entity, you can always select it and go to the Modify tab. In this case, we're selecting the bomb target. And you can see that if it has any parameters, including outputs, etc., you can edit those here. One thing that I do want to point out is that when you have an entity selected in the Modify tab, if you scroll to the very bottom, you'll actually will get a, uh, a link here to that object's uh, definition in the wiki so you can click on it and go straight to the um, help help information for that object as long as there is a help page on the wiki there are other miscellaneous tools for working with your scene for example you have a cordon manager that allows you to cordon extra sections of your scene you have the load leak file which we already showed you can also load the prt uh, this will load the portals of the scene. So you can see here that this is the portals that were generated. And um, you can visualize how the portals were broken up when it compiled. And we have this get brush by ID function, um, which allows you to select brushes by their ID. Um, this is useful if you're troubleshooting uh, information from the compiler and it gives you a brush ID. Not all compilers do that, but some do. So you may find this useful. 
and it also allows you to select uh, portals by their leaves and uh, highlight them. So for example, if we want to select leaf two, leaf, we click there and it will show us the leaf. And this is where that, uh, that leaf is at. Other topics not discussed in this is creating your own materials directly in the scene. Uh, you can create those uh, directly in Max using Substance or OSL or any other procedural function, especially if you have Wallworm Pro or Wallworm Pro Pack. And you can find all the different Wallworm functions under the Wallworm menu. And most of the ones for building your level and the level design are under this level design submenu. And there's a lot more than I can go over here in this video because we're about to wrap it up. We'll try to add some more videos that kind of discuss the specific functions and ways that you should work with uh, building your levels in Max. And again, I do not recommend building your level the way we did in this scene, brush by brush with blocks. But that's a very common way that people coming from Hammer build their scenes. And by making this video, I hope you understand the similarities and being able to translate your current information and knowledge of working with Hammer and how that translates into Max. And further uh, videos in the future, we're going to use more procedural systems for building brushes using Corvex and Shelvex and uh, keeping things more procedural. And we'll work with displacements and, and build something more fancy. Again, my name is Sean Olson. You can learn more about me at my website, seanolson.net, and you can always get the latest version of Wallworm at wallworm.com. Thank you, and have a good day. Bye.